So I, I'm going to, as uh, over the next uh, 35 minutes, I suppose, or so, just discuss a little bit about lung diseases, what the burden of lung conditions, what the common lung conditions are, um, and uh, maybe ask, you know, what can we do to protect our lungs from, from uh, pollutants or other things that uh, might impact on the lung. And then I do want to spend a bit of time, as it's an area of interest of mine, uh, talking about smoking and lung health, because I don't think you can uh, avoid discussing smoking, even though there's some fatigue for it. Um, when you're talking about lung health, because it impacts on, on pretty much uh, all, all, all lung conditions. I think there's one lung condition that is, rich, is, is less common in smokers than non-smokers. It's a type of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. I think I've seen about five cases, but that's less common in smokers than non-smokers. Uh, but mo the vast majority of lung diseases are, are, uh, can be uh, at least worsened and sometimes uh, attributed in the large or in the main to smoking. So just in terms of a uh, bit of background, in terms of what we're talking about when we talk about lung, when I talk about lung conditions, this is somewhat old now, but m nonetheless, I think, uh, is as much as it has been over the last decade. And this is what, what we die, die from uh, in Ireland. Um, uh, respiratory conditions account for about one in five or 20 percent of lung deaths, or oh, sorry, of, of, of all deaths in Ireland. So one in five people in this country will die from a lung condition, okay? About 20%, again, will die of a coronary-related event, okay, a heart-related diseases. You can see cancers are a significant cause of mortality, about, roughly about half, a little, over, a little over half, and probably form the main bag. But, of course, cancers are, these are, these are uh, cancers, excluding cancers of the of respiratory system, which are a big contributor to the mortality I mentioned there. Let me just turn this off. So... Um, Within the European Union, okay, and this is from the uh, sort of white book about uh, European lung health, if you like, um, the burden of disease, of, of, of respiratory diseases, about one in eight deaths in, in the EU are from, the res are from respiratory diseases. And about 600,000 people a year in the European Union, since the 28 countries, die from uh, respiratory disease. That's a very hefty burden uh, of, of, of disease. And six million hospital admissions. And you sort of, the minds, after a while, you, you sort of throwing all these statistics, they don't really make much sense. But over half of the, of the condition, of, of the common conditions, and two common conditions I want to touch on, lung cancer and chronic, a disease called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, um, are linked to smoking. And, uh, you know, probably would be uh, reportable in the literature if, if there wasn't smoking, okay? So lung cancers, while they occur in non-smokers in this part of the world, about 85-90% of, of lung cancers are related, are, are, have, um, are smoking-related in some way. And for those more into the sort of dismal science, uh, in terms of the economic burden, we like, we've all developed an interest in economics in the last 10 years, but uh, you know, this is the burden of lung diseases across the EU. Again, uh, this is from data from 2011, but I think it reflects the actual cost of these conditions. COPD, that one up the top there, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, in terms of direct costs, you can see that the common lung conditions, and so I'll just go down to COPD, asthma, which we, people are familiar with, lung cancer, um, which we have an interest in in Beaumont and, and, and tuberculosis. Uh, OSAS stands for obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. So this is a condition associated with, um, uh, which has become more prevalent or at least more recognized um, and is associated with episodes of uh, oxygen desaturation and, and uh, difficulty at night with breathing. Uh, it is uh, associated, most people who have this condition are at least 70 or 80 percent of them are overweight. Um, and it is a peculiar condition, but of increase, causing increasing morbidity, cystic fibrosis, pneumonia, and so forth. So about 55 billion, and about half of that then can be attributed to, to smoking-related diseases. So, you know, that's to, to emphasize that burden again. So if one in five people in, the, in Ireland die from respiratory disease, what do they die from? They die from pneumonias, quite commonly. Cancers of the respiratory system in terms of specific causes of death. Uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, as I mentioned. Other lung diseases, and then some of the rarer things. Pneumoconiosis uh, refers to inhalation, essentially diseases that, that uh, arise from inhalational damage to the lung. Um, and we, uh, um, asthma then, obviously, thankfully, uh, most patients with asthma can be well controlled now with inhaled corticosteroids, which has re revolutionized the treatment of asthma. And thankfully, not too many asthma deaths occur, although they still do in this country, and probably more than should. COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is a progressive condition. It's characterized by airflow 
uh, limitation or irreversible damage to the lung. And I think it's that irreversibility that can help us differentiate it from other lung conditions. And essentially, there's remodeling of small airways, damage to the lung, premature, if you like, um, uh, senescence or aging of the lung, apoptosis, and lots of other processes that occur. There's oxidant-mediated damage, and a lot of it is mediated by cigarette smoking. But it's progressive, and it's irreversible, and it it's causes a significant burden. And what we see when we look at the natural history of, of, of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is that we can evaluate this by looking at the lung, patient's lung function. And the pr pr principal measure we use uh, for measuring lung function is something called the forced expiratory volume in the first second, or FEV1. And what that is is a measure of, um, it is, it is acquired by getting somebody to take a deep breath in to fill their lungs to total lung capacity and then to take a forced expiration as forcibly as possible. And the first, uh, in, within the first second, the volume that's collected is called the forced expiratory volume. And it turns out to be a very, very useful uh, measure of, uh, of, of, of lung diseases and lung conditions and general lung health and indeed is a measure even in patients or in people and subjects and anybody who doesn't have lung uh, disease in terms of their, um, it is a very good and consistent marker of, of mortality and morbidity. So we've looked at forced expiratory volume in diabetics who don't have lung disease, low FEV1 is associated, worse prognosis in patients with heart disease and so forth. So as the condition or as lung conditions worsen, the forced expiratory volume De declines. And you can see that we, we initially, in, um, back in 1967, this is still the, the landmark piece on this, uh, 50 odd years later, that people who smoke regularly and are susceptible to the effects of cigarette smoke, cigarette smoke didn't suit them, is how it was probably nicely put in the, in, at that time, uh, it didn't suit you, and your forced expiratory volume fell off. And of course you run into, you can, you can plot the FEV1 with regard to disability and then death. And of course, the, the face of that is the person who has develops respiratory failure and ends up with what we call now, I think about now as a lung attack or an exacerbation of, of, of COPD. And this is somebody on a, on a, on a trolley, unfortunately, um, who has a mask here to help her breathe. It is a bi-level pressure mask which allows uh, us to, to, to try and get her over the exacerbation and the lung failure that she has. So, the, the interesting thing about COPD, and again, it's still data, but to say that of the common causes of death, and this is a WHO causes proportion of, uh, of, the, of the 1965 rate, it is on the rise. It's not just on the rise because we found a new name for something else. It's actually on the rise in, it, it, because it is, uh, it's, to a degree, it's been left, uh, left alone. It's felt to be smoking-related, and a lot of times smoking-related conditions didn't necessarily get the type of emphasis or funding that others did. So, for instance, cardiovascular disease, and you can see the impact we've made on stroke, or this was at least over that 20 or 30 years, and coronary heart disease, and interventions that reduced your mortality from those. Lung cancer is, a, unfortunately, a, a growing problem for us and continues to grow. This is lung cancer rates over, and again, 40 years or 50 years or so in men and women, um, men in blue here and women in the open red circles. And again, what you can see is that the, the, this is a, as a percentage of all cancer deaths, okay? So what per percentage of all cancer deaths, and this is in Ireland, this is Irish data, I should say from the National Cancer Registry, um, showing that the percentage of all cancer deaths attributed to lung cancer, back in the 19, late 1950s, there weren't that many patients with lung cancer, 1960s, 70s and 80s, absolute epidemic proportions of men with lung cancer. So it now accounting for about 20, 20 odd percent of the cancer deaths among men. And you can see this trend among women climbing steadily over that period. And if, if you were to map when people started smoking, you would see a, about, a, we could put up a similar graph about 20 years before or 30 years before. So this is a smoking related condition by and large um, attributed, uh, is, uh, which, um, and the difference here in prevalence reflects uh, when men and women started smoking in the last century. Unfortunately, survival from lung cancer is very poor. So if uh, this is again from the National Cancer Registry, and this is over the five years of the last decade, um, uh, and it shows the survival with all, all types of cancers. So um, this is five years survival. So if uh, you're unfortunate enough to get a cancer overall, and this excludes, sorry, small skin tumors, which are not generally 
uh, thankfully a, a cause of, of, of which are very common, um, particularly in sun damaged skin, but does, don't kill you by and large. Uh, but all other malignancies, uh, about 60% survival in Ireland from cancer. You can see those that have a better prognosis up at the top, uh, and then you can see those with a worse prognosis down at the bottom. So um, your probability of being alive five years after diagnosis of lung cancer is less than 20%. So that's pretty shocking if we compare it to the other common cancers uh, that we know about. Um, so there's, there's something going on there, and, and obviously it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's a suge it suggests that both the cause and the presentation of cancer should be identified sooner, and we're quite interested in trying to detect cancer of, cancers of the lung at an earlier point. Um, to re-emphasize the smoking piece, and I'm going to do that continuously, and I'm, I'm not going to apologize too much for that, but this is, the, um, this is a, a large epidemiological study from, from North America following uh, men and women from the age of 25, and this was done over three or four decades. Um, I, uh, yes, it was the patients, people were, subjects were recruited uh, from the 60s. And you can see that the difference between smoking and not smoking, so if you're alive at the age of 25 and you're, a smoke, you're not a smoker or you're a current smoker, you can see the fall off in your survival graph. So this is survival. If you, if, you're, if you continue to smoke, if you're a man or a woman, it's pretty equal opportunity here. You have a difference in survival of about 12 years. That's enormous, okay? So continuing to smoke, um, and, and you can see that the, the time that you give up smoking, the earlier you give up, if you give up cigarettes by the age of 40, you, most of, the, uh, most of uh, this mortality effect um, uh, is not seen. Uh, the longer you continue to smoke for, the more it's seen. And it's, 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 it's consistent across, obviously, age groups and, and so forth. Now, it's not just uh, cigarette smoking, but secondhand smoke is also particularly uh, damaging, and, and in, in, in particular to women and, and um, uh, pregnant women, I should say, um, because the, the uh, fetus in utero is very sensitive to the effects of secondhand smoke. Um, and uh, children who have high respiratory rates uh, are also so, um, uh, particularly susceptible to the, uh, to the effects of cigarette smoke. And so these are the, uh, the various conditions that have been associated with, um, in uh, pro proper studies, with, with secondhand smoke exposure. So you can see, particularly in, in children, low birth weight, which leads on to low lung function, and therefore uh, lower respiratory outcomes and outcomes for all sorts of conditions. Uh, childhood cancers and leukemia and lymphoma, congenital malformations, even premature atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis, as you probably, uh, uh, some people will be familiar, is, is uh, what we used to call hardening of the arteries. So premature changes in the vasculature, so stiffness of the arteries, that can be a marker of coronary disease and stroke and hypertension and, all, and, 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 and be, a, be a forerunner of, of all the cardiovascular problems that arise. And you can see these changes in, in, in people in their teens uh, if they've been exposed to cigarette smoke in utero. So pre pregnancy and cigarette smoking is quite complex because you say, well, how are you not getting exposed uh, in the uterus to the secondhand to the secondhand smoke as such, but clearly the, the inhalants and the things that are the toxins that are absorbed are having an impact, and so subsequently uh, those those children can be found to have um, to have uh, to have atherosclerosis. And uh, those of, of you who who would uh, think about what I said there would say, well, hang on a minute. I mean, you'd have to take the child away from the mother straight away. And actually, there has been some studies done. In regard to that, in terms of children who subsequently gone on to uh, whose 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 mother carry, who the the the, the mother uh, who either stopped smoking or uh, who was no longer uh, around or, or when when the child was growing up. So in other words, they went from an, uh, just smoking in utero to not to not being exposed to secondhand smoke when they're young. So the point is that secondhand smoke is is a is a significant cause of morbidity as well. So what other exposures in terms of lung health? So we said smoking, and we said secondhand smoking is obviously important. Well, air pollution, both indoor and outdoor, is, is, is quite relevant, particularly in, in some other parts of the world where, for example, biomass fuel is used. So you know, burning of animal uh, dung and, uh, um, um, and other biomass is used uh, instead of uh, our sort of conventional um, uh, uh, sources for energy for ourselves. It's obviously a different situation in terms of uh, our ability to access uh, power. Other, um, other exposures such as beryllium, chromium, asbestos, which was used as a lagging agent um, in, 
uh, or an insulator, I should say, um, was, and there's uh, common uh, conditions associated with asbestos-related uh, lung disease and lung damage and a particular cancer called mesothelioma. Radon gas is a naturally occurring uh, radioactive gas which formed in the soil and which leaks into the house. We've poorly ventilated houses most of the time, not today, and uh, the radon can build up and uh, again cause uh, lung damage and in particular is a, is, a, is a risk for lung cancer and synergistic with smoking. And then diet can actually impact on lung, on lung health. So obesity in particular ne uh, impacts ne negatively on lung function and I mentioned this condition obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. Um, which is associated with sleepiness and tiredness during the day and uh, a sleep disturbance at night. Um, and then the types of food and the things that we take in, not so much, in ter uh, uh, not as, as compelling as, as, say, for cardiovascular disease or hypertension in terms of salt diet and so on, but certainly high intake of highly processed foods can accelerate decline in lung function and fruits, not vegetables, but vegetables. Uh, that's my, my five-year-old says vegetables, and fish oils is recommended. So, you know, in terms of protecting the lung, we talked about smoking, secondhand smoke, a little bit about air pollution, both indoor and out, and then some diet. So what is outdoor air pollution? That's the harmful particles suspended in the air, the gases in the atmosphere that can be breathed in, obviously. Um, and there's, there's a whole lot of stuff in the air, clearly, that you can measure. Um, measure nitrogen oxide levels, ozone, uh, which people are familiar with, volatile organic compounds, which can be measured in all sorts of ways, and the size of particulate matter within the air. And so the concentration of particulate matter, which is at various aerodynamic sizes. Um, and exposure to ambient air pollution is associated with lung function impairment in children, and levels of nitrogen dioxide and, and the other things that I mentioned are certainly associated with lung function development. Um, and reduced lung function is uh, in children in, 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 in areas, so for instance in cities compared to the countryside, have been associated with increased risk of asthma and respiratory illness. There's some very nice studies looking at plotting how far you are from a main road and your risk of asthma, how far you are from a main road and your risk of having an, an, an exacerbation of asthma requiring hospitalization if you're a child. And it's linear. Um, so there's, you know, particular matter um, exposure to air pollution is, is really relevant. Now, there's been a lot of tremendous strides in the last 20, 30 years um, uh, in terms of reduction in air pollution uh, and, and uh, uh, the our quality of, of, of air, but there's quite a lot of, 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 of room to go in that area around the world, I, I think. Um, in the United States, the improve, improvement in overall life expectancy that's been over the, that, that has been seen over the last 30 or 40 years, uh, so up into the late high 80s and, and 90s in terms of your life expectancy, about 15% of that has been attributed to actually better air quality. Um, I remember uh, Los Ange looking at the Los Angeles Olympics in 1984, and, and uh, if any of you who remember that time would will, will have seen pictures of, like those at the top there, which is the smog of Los Angeles, and we used to see it around that time, and subsequently Mary Harney uh, was involved in, in smokeless fuel and, and, and uh, improving the air quality in this city. But you can see the difference uh, in terms of smog and air pollution uh, over those, uh, those uh, uh, 30 years. And as part of when they were bringing in um, legislation at that time, they nicely did a longitudinal study of children uh, who were and, and plotting exposures to air pollution, the particulate matter, the nitrogen oxide and so on, the nitrogen dioxide and other organic compounds that are in, the, uh, in air pollution, and nicely showed the impact on lung health, lung development, lung size. So essentially cleaner air, bigger lungs, okay? So uh, quite apart from, uh, so, so um, and I think that, that uh, then the lo bigger lungs, so what? Maybe the lung function is a bit bigger. What impact does that have? And you can see in this, again, uh, done from, uh, this is across all of the United States, not just in, in California, and ch showing ch changes in life expectancy plotted against reduction in particulate matter concentration. So I, what is that PM 2.5 measure? Mm -hmm. Just to, to mention, that is the, the, the aer aerodynamic particles that are less than 2.5 microns in diameter. So these small particles that can get deep down into the lung and get into the alveolar, both hit, hit, the, hit the alveolar structures and indeed uh, can be from there cause, cause damage to the lung. And you can see as there's been a reduction over time, and it's, it's a li maybe a little confusing, but the reduction over time in PM25 over those 20 years, so this is the degree of reduction in concentration per cubic meter, and you can see the changes are increased in life expectancy. So this is attributable across all these dots are different cities in the United States. So you can see there's been an increase in life expectancy associated with clean air. So clean air is good.
probably nobody here needed to be convinced of that, but in case you did, there you should, there's, there's the evidence. So I mentioned secondhand smoke, biomass fuels, okay, uh, ra radon, um, but a sec as a sort of second leading cause of lung cancer. Uh, within the uh, home environment, obviously dampness and moulds and is particularly impacting on asthma but morbidity in children and other occupational exposures um, uh, which, which, uh, which were probably a, li a life to now more occupational medicine, the occupation development of, of, of better uh, uh, conditions certainly in this part of the world but associated reduction in some of these con diseases. Um, I mentioned the biomass fuels and we talked earlier about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and the probability of having chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in this, in, uh, this province in China was associated with whether or not there was ventilation within the home or not. So having a chimney or not having a chimney. A chimney was installed in some houses and, and, and the other houses were followed. These were chimneys where, 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 where there was no, where there was, uh, sorry, houses where there was no chimney. And so the use of biomass fuels for cooking uh, which was, which is obviously very important, relevant, and you know, in, in these areas, was associated. Better ventilation is associated with better lung health. Okay, like clearly, I mean, this is just to. Uh, I'm not sure the, some people in the audience would be familiar with the, with uh, you know the lung passageways and uh, get, getting in, how particles get into the lung. And I was mentioning very small particles, those that are a particular matter of the very small two and a half micron diameter. Um, so, you know, uh, air is bre breathed through the uh, central airways, the larger airways, and then into the more distal airways, uh, and then into the air spaces, and there, uh, in, within the air spaces can cause inflammation and indeed fibrosis or scarring of the lungs. We can look at the lungs quite nicely. With a, this is a, 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 C, a, CT, uh, a CT of the lungs uh, showing, uh, you can see in the central part there, the trachea, and then a cross-section of the, of the right and left lung. Um, this is a patient I have with uh, a cold worker's pneumoconiosis. So I mentioned inhalational injuries to the lung. A pneumoconiosis is a condition associated with inhalational burden or inhalational injury. You can see com uh, on the x-ray down at the bottom right that there looks to be some changes in the upper part of the lung, but you can appreciate compared to the last CT of a normal individual. Uh, um, and again, sorry, this is maybe not going so well, but perhaps with the pointer, these, uh, these areas of, of, of large areas, which almost look like lung tumors within the lung, which are areas of scarring and fibrosis and inflammation. And this is directly attributed to, to um, a long-term exposure to, uh, to coal dust in a coal worker. So when we talk about there, the, the air that we breathe, smoking, secondhand smoke, dust exposures, uh, um, pollution and the importance of, of, of uh, for population and um, health in uh, good air and clean air. What else can we do? Well, exercise is really vital for for good lung health. Um, what exercise does it, it, it? Exercise won't actually make your lungs bigger. So we can check your lung function and check that FEV1 we mentioned, and then you can go off and train for an ultra marathon, whatever you want to do, and then you can come back and you can blow in again and we'll check your lung function again. And it won't actually make that any different. But what, what it does do is improve the efficiency with which you extract oxygen at the, mus at, the, at the muscular level, and it reduces your sensation of breathlessness when you do activities. And essentially, that's what fitness is. So you get a, what exercise has is not just an impact on the muscles, it has an impact centrally in the brain, it reduces uh, our, uh, the, um, it desensitizes people to the sensation of breathlessness. That's what dyspnea is. Dyspnea is the word we use for the sensation of breathlessness. So I feel out of breath. You might feel out of breath because you're, you know, if, for all sorts of all sorts of reasons, it's not necessarily associated with lung conditions. Decreases anxiety and depression. Okay, exercise also by, you know, the natural high release of dopamine, reduction in dynamic hyperinflation, and that's specific to lung conditions, um, whereby with a lot of lung conditions, in particular that one COPD I mentioned to you, the difficulty is as the lungs, as the airways get a bit smaller and the lungs get bigger, the air gets trapped within them and they cannot deflate properly. So if you like, it's like a balloon that's continuing to inflate and inflate and inflate. And I'm, sh I'm sure when, when, when uh, Vincent was operating on patients with significant emphysema, there were these big, baggy, inefficient lungs. And so what exercise allows those lungs to do is to deflate, to allow uh, for more um, uh, responsive or to, to allow for more efficient ventilation. And uh, most, of the, most, of the, um, most of the science in this area r relates to how the skeletal muscle function, both at the diaphragm level 
and at the intercostal muscle level and indeed in the, in the limbs is improved by exercise. So improving your, lungs, your leg strength improves your lung health uh, uh, bizarrely. So, um, and that's the case even in people with very severe uh, conditions. As I mentioned the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, again, because it's very fr common, and, and I think a lot of people don't know about it, but um, you can see that the degree of activity that you have after an admission to hospital for this condition, COPD, the probability of, of or the, the chance of having you further, having further admissions, and indeed impacting on mortality is whether or not you're exercising. Um, and uh, this is for patients with, with equal levels of lung disease, equal other um, who have uh, the, the sort of st who have uh, similar comorbidities, if you like, and so on. So this is just for exercise alone. So exercise is good for the lungs, even damaged lungs, and it's good for you know all sorts of ways. I don't see many people like that in my clinics. Unfortunately, I see a lot of people with COPD who look like this, and so even this purse slip breathing around the. Uh, uh, um, uh, it can be helpful uh, for patients to reduce that hyperinflation that I mentioned. Okay, so in terms of exercise, um, well, the general rules on exercise is that some activity is better than none, but uh, and that um, that you know, if going from a period of inactivity, it should be it should be graded rather than occur you know straight away. But in terms of the benefits, the health benefits, and this is just for lung health, but, but for cardiovascular and everything else, 60 minutes, as little as 60 minutes in a week, right? So that's not a lot, that's 12 minutes in a day. It seems to be that the key is to do something for more than 10 minutes. So two minutes, five times a week isn't gonna cut it, or even two minutes, 25 times a week, or, or 30 times a week. It might get you up to the hour, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't do it. So it's 10 minutes of exercise. For major health benefits, at least 150 minutes. That's two and a half hours of work, of, of uh, a moderate intensity aerobic activity. That's gardening, walking, any, you know, lots of different activities there. Um, so exercise, good for the lungs, and, uh, and, and can be, again, this, you can very clearly see the benefits from exercise on, um, on mortality. So I'm going to speak for the last, uh, for another ten, for few minutes about the tobacco, uh, what, I, what, we, what has been dubbed, not by me, but the tobacco century, the last 100 years, the 20th century. So around 100 million people worldwide were killed by tobacco in the 20th century, okay? And this number will increase to a billion in this century. And the reason for that is that while we're becoming uh, quite uh, concerned over the last 30, 40 years, say in this country and in other uh, uh, first world countries. Um, meanwhile, the, uh, the, the, uh, the smoking rates in, in other parts of the world uh, and in third world countries is absolutely rocketing. Um, the single, smoke, single largest preventable cause of death and disease for men and women is tobacco smoking. The data for that is irrefutable and there's no risk-free level, unfortunately, of tobacco smoke and there's no safe tobacco products. Um, you know, I won't hit you, hit, you, hit you with more statistics, but an interesting thing I often like to get asked to comment on, um, you know, impact of, of uh, various legislation on smoking rates and so on. Well, most people start smoking at an early age, and most, the vast majority of people have started smoking by the age of 20. Um, and so it can differ in different parts of, of the world. Uh, the, the reason for that, I mean, there's a, you might have seen this, that, that guy's been on the, on the internet, and unfortunately other kids like him um, who are addicted to cigarette smoke. Uh, this is a, a ad for uh, Lucky Strike cigarettes taken a, a number of years ago from a magazine. You won't see that around here anymore, but you will see it if you uh, got on a plane to, uh, to parts of, uh, um, uh, parts of some parts of the world. Um, and, you know, clearly there's, there's, there's only one co uh, cohort that's appealing to. The health consequences of smoking, um, I'm, we've talked a little bit about COPD and lung cancer, but you know, the, in, the, the thing about this slide is not so much that there's so many different things associated with smoking, but actually that um, this is the US Surgeon General's report from 2014, and the things in red are the only new things from the US Surgeon General's report in uh, 50 years ago, so in, um, uh, in, in 1964, when, when the, the first real big report on the impact of smoking damaging health. So, um, you know, uh, we've known about these, most, vast majority of these things for a long time. Uh, I suppose the reason that uh, as soon as, no sooner had the Surgeon General said that than the, the merchants of doubt as the tobacco industry have been dubbed were out in force. So, you know, yes, some cigarettes are bad for you, but, you know, Camels, they're much better. Most, most of the doctors smoke them, so they can't be bad for you. Um, we mentioned the secondhand smoke already, and uh, I won't uh, 
trouble you with that, except to say that tobacco litter in this country is now the largest, uh, uh, the largest source of, 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 of litter since the plastic bags were gone. We have been reducing our consumption over the past uh, 15 to 20 years, and it's associated with uh, the various acts, for instance, the uh, workplace amendment and smoke ban. And there are fewer people smoking in Ireland in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, of rough, about 20% at the last, uh, the last count, at the, uh, last, uh, the end of last year. Um, and the trends are good in terms of uh, young people starting to smoke. This is prevalence of cigarette smoking among 10 to 17 year olds. This is done, uh, this is a large uh, WHO sponsored uh, study um, out of uh, NUI Galway through, to which they participate. There's 15,000 kids are, are, um, uh, are, are reviewed as part of this study and it's done every four years. So you can see that the uh, smoking rates have significantly fallen, uh, which is good. And, and uh, the last Minister for Health, uh, uh, Riley uh, published this Tobacco Free Ireland policy document which was approved by the Cabinet last year uh, to get the smoking rate in this country down to 5% by 2025. So that's the Tobacco Free Ireland and what that would need is denormalisation of tobacco at every level of society. So this concept of that tobacco isn't really, or smoking tobacco maybe is not a normal uh, or shouldn't be a, seen as a normal uh, thing to do. Uh, there's lots of different co to control measures. There's been quite a bit, a bit of noise recently about plain packaging. I'm sorry, you've just had your lunch. This, these are pretty gruesome um, uh, pictures, but uh, um, these were the, the these are what's, uh, uh, the, the, as you know, this, uh, probably some of you would be aware this uh, standardized bill has been passed and signed into law by by uh, the president there about la uh, just about a month ago or so uh, for standardized packaging of tobacco. So this is cigarettes will come in drab packets with these types of health warnings, which are, you know, pretty uh, hard to stomach and look at after lunch. But that's the, I suppose, the idea. It's, uh, they have been shown in Australia, where it's, which is the only country to, to bring these in, to be uh, associated with significantly, you know, particularly among children, about reducing the attractiveness of, of cigarettes less, uh, um, as people are taking up cigarette smoking in Australia, it has the lowest rate of cigarette smoking now of any developed country. Uh, ban of smoking in cars, this is a Dr. Professor John Crown, colleague who's a senator and has proposed this ban which was also passed and then this is a, um, a West, this is Westport uh, Institute of Higher Education, uh, banned smoking on campus and college campus, and interesting so you're in, uh, in, in, in a campus now. So just in terms of, like, is it all nanny statism? Work, workplace smoke ban 10 years ago, uh, was that a good thing or not? And you could say what you like about the quality of the air quality in a restaurant or whatever. But essentially, this was about protecting uh, people who worked in the environment from second on smoke. Health benefit for the bar workers became a big issue, obviously. And so these were a cohort that we followed for uh, over that period of time, and a lot of this work was done by, uh, by Luke Clancy and his group in St. James's Hospital. But in the first year of the workplace smoke ban, hospital admissions for acute coronary events fell by 12%. So this is not uh, any impact necessarily on people smoking, but this is actually just the impact of secondhand smoke exposure. There was a 32% fall in stroke admissions and a reduction in the amount of COPD. So these are acute exacerbations of these conditions. As we know, it takes a long time uh, for the true benefits of, of any impact on cigarettes uh, to be seen. But it's, it, it, it has been demonstrated or successfully modeled that nearly 4,000 deaths, uh, fewer smoking related deaths than would have been expected. So that that's obviously uh, shows you that the, impa the, the, the impact that it has had. Um, I'm not going to talk about tobacco quitting, just to say that the, uh, within, you know, uh, uh, you, very quickly, um, very quickly there is impact and then within years the risks of heart disease and lung cancer are, are, success, are, are, are very quickly uh, brought down to, to, to quite low levels. There is quite a lot of interest. I mentioned the, uh, uh, the safer, is there a safer cigarette? So people will be familiar with the, um, the takeoff in vaping or electronic cigarettes and what are they about? Um, this is a ad uh, from, a Palmal ad um, from uh, uh, the 1960s, you like Palmal's modern design, it filters the smoke and lessens throat irritation. So this is about harm reduction from cigarettes by using a filter. Um, of course, we've subsequently discovered to our cost that the filter did really nothing. This is an electronic cigarette ad, it looks very similar. Um, but an electronic cigarette, uh, which is a nicotine delivery system using uh, electronic, usually with a vapor, um, are they, uh, I'm not sure, uh, is maybe the, 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 the there may well be this wolf in sheep's clothing, 
They're not, are they a tobacco product, a medicine, an electronic device? Nobody knows. They're not regulated in any way at the moment as a consequence. Um, it may be that it, for the, all the people who smoke cigarettes, using electronic cigarette instead would be a far better thing for their health. I've, I've no doubt it would be, but whether it will help them quit cigarettes, I'm just not sure. Um, so whether it's a really a smoking cessation aid or not. Uh, one of cause for concern is that a uh, quarter of a million uh, American teenage kids, you know, so kids under 17, uh, in, in 2013, a quarter to 250,000 had used an electronic cigarette but had never re smoked a regular cigarette. So you might say, well, you know, nicotine is an incredibly addictive substance. Using an electronic cigarette mightn't be very wise for them and they're likely to end up, um, you know, uh, using the regular tobacco products. And probably is why uh, certainly the cynic in me would say that the industry is very interested in them. Um, uh, I, uh, to finish on just the secondhand smoke thing again, and you know we've had a, pl a playground initiative in this country over the last year, uh, number of years, uh, which is good. Uh, third levels, I mentioned third level. You know, what's, there's a prize there for I guess third level smoke, uh, third level campuses to go smoke free. It might seem like a bit of a stretch. Uh, you know, you're in an open air environment and so forth. Um, why would you do it? Protecting and improve health staff and welfare of staff, of, of health and safety and welfare of staff and students. Uh, supportive environment for students or staff who, who want to stop. Um, enhance the campus environment. I mentioned the litter piece. Uh, you know, there was this, this study in Trinity, 5,500 respondents to this study. Uh, and, uh, you know, people were in favour. These are students and staff. Um, so, you know, I'll leave, I'll leave you with that about secondhand smoke exposure. This is, um, not everyone will remember, rec recognise this lady, but she's, this is Brigitte Bardot uh, in Nice in 1967 smoking a cigarette. I took this in Nice uh, last year. Uh, a plage sun tobacco. I, I, um, I know I won't ask for a show of hands of which beach you'd rather be on. I, I, I think um, I know which one I would rather be on. But uh, nonetheless, the secondhand, the the uh, environment, the secondhand smoke exposure thing, I think is 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 going to run and run. So thanks very much for the uh, opportunity again, Martin, to to, to uh, address you, and I'd be very happy to take any questions. Anyone? Yeah. Do you recommend oxygen supplementation for during exercise, say for COPD patients who are normoxemic at rest? So uh, yeah, it's a good question. The if you're normoxemic at rest, uh, you probably you would then see what the patient or the subject does when they exercise, and if they have oxygen desaturation. Uh, they will go further with oxygen supplementation. So I, I would if they desaturate when they, when they exercise. Do you see any risks to desaturating during exercise? Not really. Um, I think that it's just it's about getting further. So if you can walk further with oxygen, that's better for you. But there's no great risks. In, most people will stop because of the breathlessness rather than the fact that their oxygen level falls. And so there's no survival advantage, for instance, of giving people who, who are normoxic at rest oxygen even giving them oxygen at night if they're normoxic. Yeah. Any questions about that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose there's two, there's two questions there. The first is about obesity and lung function. You're right about that, that the obesity is associated with, a, with, with lower lung function in terms of the things that we measure, the physiologic tests, the FEV1 and so on. And we also, of course, are, from, are aware now that um, fat is a metabolically active uh, substance and there's plenty of things being produced there. Um, and a lot of inf there's a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, and whether... Uh, they have a role to play in lung cancer development. I'm not sure. I don't know if it's that strong, that link between obesity and, and, lung, uh, and protection from lung cancer. I don't really feel it is personally, and I think there's a lot of confounders in that. Um, and, uh, you know, most people who, do, who get cancer and most people who develop cancer and lung cancer present late. So by the time they have lung cancer, 
most of the time, 80% of the time, unfortunately, it's locally advanced, and they're underweight. They're underweight as a consequence of that. And so it's very difficult to tease out, is, your, you know, is a 40, say a 50-year-old, uh, who, is the BMI within, a, say, of a 50-year-old uh, who has a, a same smoking history and same lung function, is, is, the, is, uh, is the degree of adiposity a protector or not? And uh, I, I, I don't really know the answer to that, you know? I don't think, and I don't know if the science is that well developed on it either. But uh, it sounds like you're, you, you have an interest in that area. But I mean, uh, if there is, maybe, maybe you know more than I, maybe you can tell us, but I don't know if there is, yeah. yeah. There's so many confounders that when cancer actually presents in terms of weight, you know, and generally, yeah, being underweight when you have malignancy is, is a bad thing and your prognosis is worse. Michael? Yeah. Yes. And I know you know, people argue that passive smoking might be that linked to lung cancer. You know, you showed very clearly it's linked to those of other uh, yes, yes, yes. Passive smoking at the workplace across one area. The car probably is our levels of in terms of the science of it, our level of a passive smoking car are they quite high? You, you, can, you can measure them even with the car, with the, with the windows down, you know, um, so that the, that the level of exposure is quite high. So it would be at a, a level that, uh, for instance, a lot of the uh, um, air pollution or, or, or the, the um, um, a carcinogen concentration that you shouldn't be exposed to and that were, were, it, were it to be at that level outside, we'd be told not to go outside. Now, it is transient. And so in terms of its carcinogenic property, I think traveling in a car with a smoker, if that's, a, you know, five times a week, is probably of no damage. More in terms of secondhand smoke exposure for the kids is in the respiratory stuff. So the respiratory illnesses and, and presentations for chest infection, presentation for asthma, and so on. I think the, the, the secondhand smoke as a cause of lung cancer is, is still, as, as you know, debated. And I'm not sure that it's, it's, very, it's a very compelling, certainly, like everything, which is, you know, if there's an association, it fulfills the, the postulates of the dose and the, the duration. So if you've been a, a secondhand smoke, if you've been exposed to secondhand smoke for more than 30 years, in particular women with, with men, and maybe that's because that cohort is just greater, um, there has been uh, some evidence to suggest that there is an increased risk there. But, you know, protracted uh, secondhand smoke exposure is very difficult to demonstrate. So it's probably more the acute things that we do find. So the acute changes in blood, acute ch you know, because as, as, as probably people are aware here, you know, smoke a cigarette, take, draw some blood and after smoking a cigarette, and you can see activation of all sorts of pathways within the blood. So we know that there's an acute thing, whether or not as uh, that, uh, and even secondhand smoke exposure, you can look at blood and you can look at urine and you can see metabolites of the smoke, and um, whether or not that's, they're in the long term carcinogenic for the lung, I'm not sure. But they have been associated with, as I said, childhood illnesses, childhood leukemia and lymphoma in particular. Yeah. yeah. Plus, in the early days of cigarettes, uh, I think there's probably a folk tale that smoking might protect against TB and so on. But from what you're saying, probably lung infection rates are higher with smoking. Yes, unfortunately they are, yeah. I mean, the common things we see are uh, pneumonias, uh, and uh, uh, pneumonia is much more common in people who smoke, and TB reactivation is much more common in people who smoke as well. So, yeah, unfortunately, that, that didn't really pan out. Um, one of the, thing, one of the, uh, the big treatments for TB um, uh, before there was uh, medication, before there was anti-TB anti medication, was to make the environment hypoxemic, and so the lung would be collapsed down or the lung, you know, something to try and prevent air or oxygen getting in, which was going to drive the infection. And so many people tell stories about getting their, uh, something into their lung to compress it or to have their lung repeatedly collapsed. So it was, a, it was uh, customary to do uh, recurrent collapsing or pneumothoraces of the lung. Vincent will be familiar, obviously, a lot with this uh, uh, data. And so the surgeons would come by and deflate the lung and then keep the lung down and prevent air getting into it. Um, and I suppose you could, you, perhaps the argument was made that, well, 
you know, there's less oxygen or something in the, in the tobacco air, so perhaps that would be a good thing. But actually it doesn't pan out in any way. Um, and, uh, yeah, as I said, the, there, there is, and like after a lot of uh, uh, study on this, there's the only, the only uh, the condition that's associated with, with, is a hypersensitivity lung condition. Um, that's not a, a very common thing, but that is, associated, that is less common in people who smoke for whatever reason. Plus, there's no indication that the tobacco industry worldwide is getting the message and you know, they have plenty of time to diversify. Yeah. Um, but it appears as if they're just pushing the products in the Far East. Is that it's very difficult too. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a phenomenally uh, successful business with a, with, um, a very profitable, uh, in which probably all of us on known have, uh, have, have some interest in terms of, say, pensions and so forth, okay? And so it's a very difficult one to, to deal with. Um, and it's probably a matter of trying to wean the, uh, you know, the, the industrial world off a cigarette in more than just a way of taking the cigarette out of the hand or saying you can't smoke in my house or whatever. So um, the electronic cigarette might be something that has some promise there in that the, in that the industry um, uh, are, are, are certainly ramping up their involvement in that area, in the secondhand smoke area, or in, sorry, in the, in the electronic de delivery area. Um, but um, it's, it's uh, you know, if you think about the cigarette, and ever since the, there was a, the rolling machine, which is about 110, 120 years old now, uh, since the rolling machine was invented to quickly roll tobacco into, uh, it, there's been no real modification needed. So if you think of other industry where you've had to, you know, change, modify, R&D, everything else, nothing. It's just tobacco grown in the fields, roll it quickly, sell it on, nothing else. It's so simple. So that's why the profit margin is enormous. And so their need to try and change is, is very, the, 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 uh, without sort of, a lot of, of pressure externally, and particularly from legislators, from from governments and legislation. It, it, it's it's you know, it, you could see why why they, why they wouldn't necessarily want to change. You know, despite the fact that, you know, we've been counting the bodies for a long time, far far too long. You know. And is the say in place like India and China? Mm. Is, is there a heavy tax as well? Or? There is, but in China, for instance, the, uh, the, uh, the state is uh, involved in the ma manufacture of tobacco, so very heavily. So, um, you know, it's a difficult one to try and, um, uh, you know, they want the tobacco industry to succeed. Thankfully, most parts of the other parts of the world, apart from the U.S., which is the big tobacco group producer for here, um, you know, that doesn't exist. So in Ireland, for instance, di direct jobs, uh, the, the, I think the last cigarette production plant, in, uh, which was in Northern Ireland, uh, has, has, is, is, is set to close next, uh, in the next few years. So there's about 150 people involved in that plant. So there reason, really isn't a compelling reason from, an, you know, from that economic perspective to support the industry. You know? <coughs> Whereas in other parts of the world, a lot of, um, a lot of employment uh, and is generated from it. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's why it's so difficult to move in the area. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. No evidence for that, except to say that fitter patients do better. But in terms of active pulmonary rehab, uh, there isn't a great body of literature on um, how that, what that, how that should, what sort of, what form that should take. A lot of patients with with lung cancer have coexisting COPD common pathway in, t uh, in terms of, you know, lung damage. But um, uh, there, there, there's not great literature. Getting people m mobilized after surgery and so on, obviously that's good. Uh, but uh, th I think, don't think there's a great literature on, on actually pulmonary rehabilitation in those, in those cohorts. And is cancer-related fatigue an issue in lung cancer patients? Oh, yeah. Yes, very much so. Yeah, and that could be influenced, as you say, by, in a natural way by, by pulmonary rehabilitation, yeah. I think access to pulmonary rehabilitation has been has stymied its development in this part of the world, uh, in Ireland. I know I send a lot of people down to you. <laughs>